happy Sunday. It's good for us to be together today. And here in South Africa, it is Father's Day. And so happy Father's Day to, to all the fathers. Um, we hope and pray that you would have a, a blessed, relaxed day and it's filled with the Lord's grace. Um, and that is not only extended to those who have been blessed uh, to be um, biological fathers, but also to those who would play the, the father role, the father figure role um, in, in households. Um, we just pray that you would know the Lord's blessing, know the Lord's wisdom um, and guidance uh, as you would, as we would um, just play that role and under the Lord be led by him as we would lead our families. We just want to welcome you uh, wherever you may be and however you may be viewing this, uh, particularly if Tableview Baptist is your spiritual home. It's good to be together again in, in, in family, um, even though it is in this digital form. And also extend a word of welcome to anyone who may be visiting us um, for the first time through the internet. It's good to have you with us. We just have one or two quick um, announcements just for, for those that do consider Tableview their spiritual home. Uh, firstly, uh, we just want to remind everyone of our weekly devotions that go um, live every Monday to Friday at 7 o'clock on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed to that uh, yet to get notifications, please do, please do subscribe. Um, as well as remind everyone on Monday at 7 o'clock, we are just calling the church to, to pray, um, to, to, make that, to make that time in your families, by yourselves. Um, but if, also understanding that if 7 o'clock is inopportune, we we'll just ask you to, to take out a chunk of Monday just to, just to pray, to seek the Lord's wisdom, to pray for the church, to pray for our country, um, to pray for each other, um, and just pray that the Lord's grace would be seen and felt in the midst of this time. This last week on Thursday evening, we met to, as, an, as a leadership of the church um, just to, to discuss um, whether or not we would be opening the, the church doors for physical service again. Um, and after much um, prayer and consideration, we have decided to remain closed for physical services and continue in this digital format. I know that some may be disappointed um, at that decision. I also know that some may be relieved at that decision. Um, and we would, just after consideration um, and prayerfully just seeking the wisdom of the Lord, we know that here in Cape Town we are the hotspot um, for Corona in South Africa. And we also know that, um, statistically speaking, we have not yet hit the peak of the corona um, outbreak and so we were just um, we were on the side of prudency um, to continue in this format longing for the day that we do gather today together again um, but also just ask you as the church just to be praying for us as leadership and um, for the elders and the deacons um, these decisions aren't reached lightly um, and easily and we do long for the time to be um, back together again Let's pray. Uh, let's pray for us as a church. Let's pray for each other. And let us pray that we would surrender under the holy, holiness of the Lord and the weight of his word this morning. Father God, we come before you and we know that you are majestic, that you stand over all creation. Lord God, that you hold the universe in the palm of your hand that you are an awesome God. And forgive us for the times, Lord God, when we have minimized you, when we have played down your majesty so that we can understand you. Lord God, I would pray that we would know that you are beyond us, that we would have a sense of awe and wonder before you, Father God. I pray, Lord, too, that as your church, we would not be the ones who would fall into the secular society and just think of you as our servant. But Lord God, that we would lift up the holiness of God, that we would proclaim the mighty hand of the Lord, but we would also proclaim the glorious grace and love of the Lord too. Father, may we rise up as your church, being the light and the salt that you have called us to be, that you have placed us on this earth to be. And Father God, we would pray for our church here in Tableview, but we would also pray, Lord, for the local church in South Africa. Those, Lord, churches that would proclaim Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. Those that would stand under your word and sit humbly in submission to you. Pray, Lord God, that you would have your hand over us, that you would give us as your church great wisdom and great wonder before you. 
but we would also pray, Lord God, for the church universal. We would pray, Lord God, for all those around the world that would be gathering today in different mediums, that they would stand in wonder at the awe of who you are, and stand in wonder at the glorious grace poured out to us through your Son, Jesus, on the cross. Pray too for the persecuted church, that you would strengthen them in their physical weakness. Lord God, that they may be strong in their faith in you. We pray too for missionaries here in our church. We think of the Luprinis, Lord God, that we would support and we would ask your hand of grace and leading over them. But we would also pray for the McDonald's, Lord, as they would serve in SIM. Give them much wisdom in the midst of this time and their strategic role that they would play. We would also pray, Lord God, for our students. We pray, Lord, for Josh. We pray for Ryan. We pray for Ndungu. That even in the midst of this coronavirus and their studies, as they would seek to serve you through their studies, would you raise them up, place your hand over them, and give them much guidance and grace in this time. We ask, Lord, for our time this morning. And as we sit under your word and continue into Philippians, May you be honoured, may you be glorified, and may, may we be humbled before you, the King of Kings. Amen. I just want to read just before we go into time of worship and song from Romans chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 6 to 11. But while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For while one, for one will scarcely die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What a majestic thought. What a majestic truth. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, we have been, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let us sing together. Yeah. Hey. 
morning everyone it's nice to be with you this Sunday morning I did a bit of homework for my children's talk and I asked some of the kids in the church to look at something and tell me what they saw so Hannah and Eden were shown a piece of paper with this on and some of the kids I sent this to their moms and asked them to tell me what they saw now to start off with there's no wrong answers but this is what was shared um, I'll show you some videos and then I'll come back. I only see ginormous dots and, and smaller. Okay. That's it? Okay. Eden, what do you see that Hannah's holding? Can you tell me what you see? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Tell me what you see. Um, four dots. That's it. No, again what? Um, yeah, that's it. Hannah, what did you see on the, what I showed you? Dots. Dots? Just dots? Oh, wait. No, it, it, it's, I see coloring, like a pencil on there. No. Just dots, I okay, Some of you saw some dots um, as well. Uh, Isabella saw four different size dots. She was a bit more specific. Armani and Aviela said the dots looked like a footprint. Or uh, Aviela also said it could be a Mickey Mouse face. And none of those answers, as I say, are wrong. But nobody seemed to focus on the big white space or the big piece of paper that the dots were on. And so often in lives, we like that. We notice the black spot and not all the other blank white around it or the good around it and I want to challenge you at the moment or through your life to actually not just focus on the black things or the the, the black spot or the the negative things in life or the problems because there's so much else in life that is fantastic and we can count our blessings rather think about what you do have instead of what you don't have or um, a, a, a home to live in um, food that we can eat, um, parents that look after us, um, lots of things, all your toys that you may have or the things that you can do that you can even run around each day and um, we can um, do so many things with a healthy body. And in uh, Philippians 4 verse 8 it says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So that verse is telling us to focus on the good. Don't focus on the bad, focus on the good. And even though there are problems and black spots in our lives or things that worry us, remember Romans 8 verse 28 says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So even those black spots, God can use and turn it into something good in our lives, something that we can learn from and make us stronger. So when we're tempted to complain or look at the, the, the things that are going wrong in, our, wrong in our life, let's remember those verses and instead look at all the good things and count our blessings, the things as, that God has blessed us with. Let's pray quickly. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for all the wonderful things that we have in our life that are from you. We just open our eyes and look around and we can see all the things that you have blessed us with. I think especially if we thank you for our parents that are looking after us at this time and caring for us and having to be really patient with us. And Lord, we just thank you that we can remember the good things and even those bad things that come along in our life, Lord, that we can trust you to turn those into a good thing in your time. So we thank you for this, Lord, and we pray that you would be with us for the rest of the day. Amen. Thanks, guys. See you soon. Good morning, church. Today's reading will come from Philippians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. I urge Yoda and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true comrade, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Can we pray? Dear Lord Jesus, 
I pray for the leaders of our country. I ask my God that you give them the wisdom that they need to make the right decisions as we face this pandemic together as a nation. I ask my God that for Christians out there, that we may be a shining light in all that we do. While the world is in fear, while the world is in panic, I pray my God that we may show stability. I pray that we may show constant trust in you. I ask my God that in how we react, people may see us in a different light. And we may use these opportunities to spread your gospel and your word amongst the nations. I pray that today, as it is Father's Day, I ask that as a father, you give us the strength and you give us the wisdom that we may show the world how men are, are supposed to act according to your family design. I pray that you may show the world how men are supposed to treat women and children through us and that we may see that what is going on in this world today is not normal and that we may look back to your design and follow your instructions and find that that is the only way to solve the problems that exist in society today. I pray, God, that for those that are struggling to make ends meet. I know that when you're in that situation, it's like a never-ending. But I pray that you give us the comfort to know that these problems are only temporary. However, you as our God are constant, and that you are with us through the end. I ask, my God, that for those that are in hospital, that are in ICU due to the COVID-19 virus, I hand them over to you. I specifically bring our brother Kennedy Mulenga to you and I ask my God that your will be done. Bless us as a nation. Bless us as a country, my God. Then I ask that you will be with us always. Amen. Thanks so much, Joel. Thanks so much, Brez. As we've just read, uh, we continue in the book of Philippians and we are now in the last chapter. Uh, chapter 4 of the series, uh, Chained Yet Joyful. And this, this whole book has been such a, a glorious meal um, of deep theological truth and practical um, application to our day-to-day -day lives. But what we're going to see today is that after the, the, the great outpouring of theology that we've been exposed to throughout um, chapter 3 of Paul showing the church this is the true gospel and be a God against these false doctrines of the Judaizers. This is how you know Christ. Paul is going to today just get really practical and can I use the word blunt with the church? See, I think sometimes we would read the, the, the letters, especially in the New Testament, and think that oh, the church then must have been this glorious place to be part of. But the truth is that I think if we think like that, then we are reading it through rose-tinted glasses. Because the perennial problem of the human heart is sinfulness, is a sinful heart. And so Paul addresses this in the letters. Absolutely there is teaching. Absolutely there is brilliant unpacking of theology and explanations of that. But at the same time, these letters are written to address conflict, to address heresy, to correct false teaching and to call the believers back to the straight and narrow path of the gospel. And so with that set up, we've seen here today Paul get blunt with two women in the church. So let's start off with what we don't know about this whole situation. So what we don't know is we don't know what the conflict was. We don't know what the issue was around and we don't necessarily know who these women were other than the fact that they were born again believers. Paul is writing here, and so let's talk now about what we do know. Paul is writing to Christians in the church. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to Christians. How do we know that he's talking to Christians? Well, listen to the language that he uses here in verse 3. Help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel to, together with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. And so Paul says two things about these women. Number one, they're part of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. And so that is a euphemism for saying they are born again believers filled with the Holy Spirit. Added to that, they were laborers in the gospel. These were not necessarily immature Christians, but these were women that played some form of leadership role within the church. They were looked up to and respected within the church. 
And so we don't know some things, but we do know who the women were. And we do know that this issue was big enough for Paul to call them out on it. Now, just imagine sitting there and the elder of the church has stood up and he's reading this letter. And obviously it wasn't written in chapter and verses, we would have it today. But they would have got through the equivalent of the first three chapters. And then all of a sudden you are Euodia, you are Zinchia sitting in the church. And all of a sudden you hear these words. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Zinchia to agree in the Lord. And all of a sudden you would have looked up and people would have maybe looked at you and just kind of gone, whoa. He calls them out directly. Now, why does he call them out directly? Why doesn't he just go, I know that there's conflict in the church. He's already said a little bit, he hinted towards that in chapter 2. Why doesn't he just carry on hinting at that and hope that they would have got the message and carried on with that and resolved the conflict? I think for two reasons. Number one, by calling them out by name, they are without excuse to say, well, we didn't know that we were in the wrong. And number two, and this is more important, I think, it shows the heart of Paul for the church. He is jealous in the good sense of the word for the unity of the church, for the gospel to be spread and for the people to hear the gospel and respond to it. And in order for that to happen, he's talking and he is calling the church to be a stable, firm place for believers to grow. Instability within the church, conflict within the church causes hindrances to the gospel. And so Paul is calling these women, deal with your issue because it has gospel consequences. Deal with your issue for it has gospel consequences. Now, this is important for us is because what we may think today is just going, well, this was written to them and we kind of like peering in and watching what Paul is saying to these two women. But as much as it was written to those two women in the church, as well as the whole church, but directed at those two women in the church, it is directed at our hearts today. Why? Because the same conflict that existed in the church 2,000 years ago can have the same effect of dividing the Lord's church today. And so we need to be on guard against that. Why do we need to be jealous for the unity of the church? Number one, the outside world is watching. And they are watching to see if we are as graceful to one another as we would preach to be. They are watching to see if our actions line up with our words that we would teach and preach. Number two, Paul has already in chapter 3 spoken about the external influences that are looking to divide the church, namely the Judaizers. But now he is also warning them against an internal rift that can quickly come and open that up. I mean, just from a personal side, how many of us have heard of churches splitting over somewhat trivial issues and what is personal conflict that has not been resolved and has actually caused division within the church. And it doesn't build the church. In fact, it hinders the church. But number three, we are called to guard the spiritual stability of the church. And how are we called to guard the spiritual stability of the church? We look at Philippians 1 verse 27. In Philippians 1 verse 27 it says this, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, live a life that is consistent with the message that you are preaching to the world. Guard that the gospel would not be hindered by personal sinful conflict. The perennial issue of the human heart is sin. And just because we are 2,000 years later, it does not mean that we don't face conflict within the church. If you've been in the church for any number of years, you would know that conflict happens. And so this conflict, before we get into looking at how Paul deals with it and calls him to deal with it, 
we need to just know that this conflict is not theological. The reason why I can say that with so much certainty is because if it was theological, Paul would have corrected the error and he would have corrected the divide as he does throughout all of his other epistles. When there is division around theology, he steps in and corrects those who are wrong and he encourages those who are right to stand firm. But here, he doesn't do any of that. He doesn't pick sides. He doesn't say, listen, you're in the wrong and you're in the right. What we have here is two women who don't like each other, two women who don't get along, and they are leaders within the church, and they are causing division. And Paul stands up and he says, stop it. For the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the unity, if you are mature believers, you stop this now. And so how does he call them to deal with the issue? Let's look at verse 2. I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Sinkia to agree in the Lord. Now, that word, agree, is an important word because it's the same word that is used here in chapter 2, verse 2, and chapter 2, verse 5. Let's read that together. Philippians 2, verse 2. Complete my joy by being in the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and one mind. And then we see the same meaning in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And so this word here that we see specifically in verse 2 is the same word that is used. And it says this, the direct translation of it is this, think in the same direction. And so we may miss that, the nuanced meaning of that in the English, where it says this, agree in the Lord. But what he's actually calling them to is not just to a subtle agreement in the Lord, but to have the same focus in the Lord. Now, why would he call them to have the same focus in the Lord? Because their focus was divided. Their focus was no longer on the kingdom of God. Their focus was on themselves. He is, he is appealing here to mature Christians. And again, he's not interested in who is right, who is wrong. But he is calling them to stop thinking about themselves, to stop focusing on themselves and to focus on the gospel. And so the first thing that we need to know when we are going to deal with conflict, interpersonal conflict within the body of Christ is that we are to have a kingdom mindset about conflict. And that if you do not have a kingdom mindset about conflict, then you will just be focused on yourself. You see, the way you think is central to the Christian life. Throughout the scriptures, we are called to address our thinking. We are called to align our thinking to scripture. We are called to bring our thinking in line with who God is, in line with the Holy Spirit. You see, and what conflict causes us to do is it causes us not to think about the kingdom anymore. But it causes us to think about me, my agenda my hurts, my offense that I am bearing. And so it no longer becomes about the gospel and us being servants of Christ, have the same mindset as Christ, who did not consider equality with God something to be held, but he became humble. He stepped down from the, from the Father, wrapped himself in humanity. We are to have that Mindset of ultimate humility, of the ultimate servant. But what conflict does is it makes your Christian life about you and yourself and about your pleasure and about the fact that you need to be right. And if that is your attitude, you are being pulled away from effective Christian service. And I would say this, you are not as mature as you may think that you are. Conflict should not be entertained within the church. 
It should be dealt with and it should be put behind us so that the gospel is not hindered. Get your focus right as a Christian. It is not about our rights and whether the fact we are right or wrong, but it is about the kingdom. But added to that, he also reminds them that they are part of a team. You look at verse 3, and he says to them, they've worked side by side with Clement and the rest of the fellowship. And he adds to that, and he says, and their names are in the Lamb's book of life. Now, why does he add that their names are in the Lamb's book of life? It's because he is reminding them of the eternal significance of what they are doing here. And what they are jeopardizing here. Conflict hamstrings the church in the mission to be the light in the world. It hamstrings the church in its witness to the world. And so have the right view about your conflict and realize that conflict has significant damage. And so it needs to be dealt with quickly. But let's build on this as we move to point number two. If your sinful nature can't pull you away from focusing on the Lord, well then what it's going to do, and we need a guard against this, is it's going to cause you to focus in on yourself. And so your life becomes about yourself. And so let's build on this. And let's look at how James deals with this in James chapter 4, verse 1 to 10. And so, just before we read it, what we're going to see is that the very first verse in James chapter 4, verse 1, deals with our issue that we are dealing with today, head on. But what he also does within the first five verses, is he brings in a whole bunch of other issues that cause problems within the Christian life, that cause conflict within the Christian life. And then what we're going to see is we're going to see verse 6 to verse 10, the solution to all these problems that exist within the Christian's life. And so let's read together James chapter 4 verse 1 to 10. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? It's exactly what we're speaking about here. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you can, cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you asked wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, He, who, he yearns jealously over, over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But I tell you, he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to the Lord. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves, therefore, before the Lord and he will exalt you. And so if I can summarize verses 6 to 10, the response that James gives to the problem that he puts out in the first verse, what causes quarrels among you? What causes conflict among you? The summary from verse 6 to 10 is this. Humble yourself and get right with God. If you want to deal with all of these issues that would cause so much conflict between us and the Lord and us and each other, it, result, it, it, it comes down to us not having a right relationship with the Lord. And so he says this, humble yourself and get right with God. Why is that so important when it comes to dealing with conflict within the church? With, between believers as born-again Christians. Because we as born-again Christians are not perfect. 
I think we all know that. Every single one of us, if you've been a Christian for longer than 10 minutes, you would know that we still wrestle against sin. The, the war has been won, but the battle still rages on until that glorious day. And so very often within conflict, both of the parties are dealing with individual sin that is contributing towards the conflict. And so in order for us to deal with conflict effectively, in order for us to have the right view, to, have, to be pulling in the same direction, to agree in the Lord with one another when it comes to conflict, what do we have to do? We first have to be right with the Lord. Humble ourselves before the Lord before we would seek to deal with the conflict that exists here. If there is conflict between you and the Lord, if there is unrepentant sin between you and the Lord, do not be surprised when there is unrepentant sin and conflict between brothers and sisters. Now, why do I say this? Because when we humble ourselves before the Lord, when we acknowledge our sin before the Lord, something powerful is happening at that moment. We are recognizing our need for a Savior, and we are recognizing that we are not perfect. We are recognizing that we are not always right. And often what stands at the center of conflict, as we've just read, is someone wanting their own way. Having a me mindset instead of a kingdom mindset. And so, I'm going to say this. If you as a born again believer cannot humble yourself before the Lord first and be right with the Lord, you will not seek forgiveness and humility before other Christians. And so we are called first and foremostly to humble ourselves before the Lord, realize that we are sinners in need of grace, turning to the Lord, say, Lord, wash me, cleanse me of my sin, make me humble. And when both parties have that mindset of recognizing that they are sinners saved by grace, and they would come together with humility in the Lord, both recognizing that they are both saved by grace. All of a sudden, the atmosphere in the room is completely different. All of a sudden, the focus in the room is completely different. It's no longer about me getting my own way. It's now about, uh, we are brothers and sisters, both saved by grace. And whatever our conflict is, it is not greater than the gospel. When you would think that your conflict is greater than the gospel, you are showing how arrogant and proud you actually are in your heart. And so what stops us from turning to the Lord in humility? What would stop us from being humble before the Lord and seeking His face before we would go and seek the right relationship with one another? I would say this. We are great at blaming other people and believing that they are the problem to our issues. We are great at blaming other people and justifying to ourselves why we are right. I mean, how often do we do this? Isn't this so much of the problem within our marriages? Isn't this so much the problem within our relationship with our parents, with our children, with our bosses, with our colleagues, with our friends, with our families? That we don't recognize sin within our own hearts, but we are quick to recognize the sin in someone else's heart and in someone else's life. And if that is the attitude, then you will be finding yourself in a lot of conflict very often. But when humble Christians would recognize that actually, you know what, I too have a sin problem. I too am in need of grace. I too am saved by a perfect Savior. Praise the Lord for His grace. You know what, you and I can have grace towards one another then too. And so we become masters 
of justifying why we are correct and the other person is wrong. But worse than that, we become masters at carrying the weight of unforgiveness towards other people for the wrongs that they have committed to us. And we learn to live with bitterness in our hearts. We learn to live with unforgiveness. We learn to live with unresolved conflict. And we just think it's normal. It's not, Christian. I'm reminded of this, if I could just illustrate it in this way. I'm reminded on my 21st birthday, got out of the car, and as I got out of the car, I stood on a glass bottle that was facing up, and a shard of glass went into my foot. And I remember the agony of that, and as I just had to pull out the glass and go and get it cleaned out. And for days and weeks, there was pain at that wound, but then eventually the wound closed up and from the naked eye it looked like it was healed but what i didn't know was that there was a tiny little shard of glass left within my foot and although from the outward it looked like it had completely healed inside there was this tiny little thing and every single time i stood at just the wrong angle on my foot sharp pains shot up my leg and i was reminded of this tiny little Injury, this tiny little offense that was in my body. And is it not the same with conflict? We may think, well, that time heals everything. But in in fact, what we've actually learned to do is we've just learned to live with the pain. And every now and again, when you would see that other person who's wronged you, when you would hear the name of that other person who's wronged you, when you would think of the offense itself, all of a sudden that time that shot of agony, of offense, runs up your body again and you are reminded of that hurt. My brother, my sister, that is a sign of unforgiveness, of bitterness in your heart. Can I tell you how the story ends? One night, I sat down, just so frustrated with the pain in my foot, and I sat down with the scalpel that I got, and I had to open up that wound again. And in agony, I still remember this, In agony in my little flat, I pulled out this tiny little shard of glass and I was astounded to know that just such a tiny shard was causing me so much discomfort. And it can be the smallest offense that can cause a massive breakdown within the body of Christ. Deal with your offenses. Deal with your issues that you would have with one another. Seek the Lord first on this. Surrender it to the Lord. Pray, Lord, Lord, what are the issues within my heart that I'm holding onto this unforgiveness towards this other person? That I'm holding onto this anger towards this other person? That the two of us, we cannot be brothers and sisters in the church. And please, I'm not putting forward some placated just kumbaya we all have to be best friends and hang out all the time i'm fully aware that sometimes well people just don't get on but we're not talking about two people who just like they just don't gel they just don't click we're talking about two people that are causing conflict over their dislike for one another and that cannot be right and it should not be right and it cannot be tolerated And so in the midst of all of this, if you are feeling that hurt towards someone else, let's modify a Martin Lloyd-Jones quote for us. That we ought to stop listening so much to ourselves and we ought to start talking more to ourselves. Now that might sound weird in this context, but you have to stop listening to your hurt, to all the problems that you would be wrestling with in your heart. And what we need to start doing is we need to start preaching. We need to start talking about the gospel. We need to start reminding our hearts of the grace of God within our lives. Stop listening to yourself and start talking to yourself about things that are going to grow you in the gospel. Stop listening to your justification for sin and start preaching the gospel of grace to your heart. 
But there's a third thing that we also see in this passage. First one being, we need to have a right kingdom mindset about conflict. Number two, that we need to be humbled in our dealing with conflict and recognize that we are sinners ourselves, saved by grace. Number three, sometimes we need a third party to step in and assist. Let's read verse three together. Yes, I ask you, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together. Now, we may often just skip over that, but do you get the plea that Paul is putting forward to the elder in the church? We can assume it is an elder in the church. We don't know exactly who this is, although there's a little bit of um, debate around who Paul is asking to assist. But he is asking someone to step in and help these women. He says, I ask you, true companion, help these women to deal with this issue. Walk with them. You know what the issue is. Walk with them. Mediate the problem that there can be unity again within the church. Now, last week, our last point coming from chapter 4, verse 1, was this. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. And so we spoke about... Knowing Christ means standing firm in the face of persecution, means standing firm in the face of fear of the world. But I would ask us this question. How do we stand firm? How do we stand firm? One of the primary graces God has given us to enable us to stand firm together is brothers and sisters in Christ, in the church, linking arms with us and helping us to stand. I love driving down the roads here um, in Cape Town and especially to see some of these single solitary trees, how they've just faced years and years and years of abuse from the southeaster that blows during, during summer. And you would know if you've lived in Cape Town for a while, you would know that some trees they just stand and they just grow at an angle as they've just been pushed by the wind. Now what I've noticed is almost always those trees that are so slanted and growing with the direction of the wind are almost always by themselves. But when there is a group of trees standing together in tight unity with, other, with one another, they buffer each other from the force of the wind and they are able to grow up straight and true as they are designed to be. And it is the same within the church. We are called to stand firm, united with one another. And one of the ways in which we stand firm with one another is helping each other deal with conflict in a biblical way. And the problem with this, though, is that over the years, I don't know when it happened, definitely happened before my time, it was seen as a weakness to seek mediation. It was seen as a weakness to admit that you have a problem and you need someone to step in and help mediate the conflict. And I want to call us, church, you are not weak if you admit that you need mediatory help. In fact, it's the cornerstone of the gospel. Hebrews calls Jesus Christ our mediator. If you are a Christian, you have called out to the mediator and you have said, Lord, I need you to stand on my behalf and assist me in this. Fight my battle on my behalf. And so when there is conflict within the church, one of the primary ways, one of the primary graces God has given us is the wisdom of other brothers and sisters that can come alongside us and to help mediate the problem. But why don't we seek mediation more often? I think it refers to the very point that we've just spoken about from verse 2 in James chapter 4. We push back because of our pride and our thinking, and I am right, and I don't need help in this. It's not as big of a problem as it may be made out to be. 
And that is proud that would say that to our hearts. That we are not in need of assistance. That we can do this by ourselves. But as we are discipled by one another, this is exactly from James 3 verse 17. As we imitate mature believers, we walk with them and we, we learn how to deal with conflict. And even if you are a mature believer in conflict, turn to other mature believers to walk with you in this. If you are in conflict today with another believer, are you willing to seek mediation? Would you be willing to seek the assistance of a mature brother and sister so that there can be unity in the body again? Are you willing to admit that there is sin that exists that is causing division? See, blessed are the peacemakers. Matthew 5 verse 9. Blessed are the men and women who would step in and make peace where there is a problem. Notice that he doesn't say this, blessed are the peacekeepers, but blessed are the men and the women who would see turmoil and step in and make peace where there is war. Recognize that division can cause, that conflict can cause division, and division can be detrimental to the witness of the church. And so I encourage you today to ask yourself this question. Am I a peacemaker? Am I one who seeks the peace of the church, the unity of the church? Or are you the opposite, a troublemaker? Are you one that would be causing conflict through gossip? Are you one that would be causing division through proudful remarks about other brothers and sisters within the church? Are we guilty of slander? Are we guilty of blame shifting? I call us today, as Table View Baptist, to fight for unity within our ranks, to stand firmly on the grace given to us, Recognize that we are sinners saved by grace, but constantly in need of grace. And recognize this final truth that I will share with us. That our forgiveness of one another's failures and sins is based on the fact that you and I were firstly forgiven our failure and sin by the Lord God Most High through Jesus Christ on the cross. I'm reminded of the epic parable that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35. I'm not going to read it now, but I will just share it briefly. There was a king who settled his debts, and he found that one of his servants had a massive debt owing to him, equivalent to today's age of millions of rands. And so he calls his servant before him, and he says to him, Oh, give me the money that you owe. And his servant begs for mercy to be given to him, and the king gives him mercy and settles the debt, writes it off. And this is a mountain of debt that he was unable to pay. He would never be able to settle this debt by himself. He would be damned because of this debt. But as he's leaving, he sees a fellow servant who owes him a couple hundred rand. He grabs and beats him and tells him, give me the money that you owe me. The other servants look at this and are shocked knowing that he has just been forgiven a massive debt. I go and tell the king, and the king calls back the original servant. And he says, how dare you do that? I forgave you this massive debt. And you wouldn't even forgive someone who owed you a couple hundred rands. And he has him thrown into prison until the full debt can be paid. And Matthew 18, verse 35, finishes with this crushing verse. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. 
the command and the basis for forgiveness, for the settling of our offenses to one another, is because we have been forgiven of the debt that damned us, that was impossible for us to pay, and that debt was sin. And the Lord forgave us of our sin to Him. And ultimately, all sin is sin against the Lord, first and foremostly. And the statement is this. If you are unable to forgive another, well then you haven't truly received forgiveness yourself. Now I know that that is hard, and I know that many of us carry deep burdens and hurts within ourselves. But this is not a negotiable thing that the Lord is calling us to do. I know that it can take time. I know that in the same way as I did dig out that painful little shard from my foot and it was agony to do so. I know for some of us to relive past hurts, it's agonizing for us to do so. But not only is the unity of the church at stake, but if we are to take the words of Jesus as he says it, our souls are at stake too. And so if you are a born-again Christian and you have been forgiven, do not withhold forgiveness from a fellow brother and sister. Let us pray together. Father God, we thank you for grace. We thank you that we have been saved by grace. We thank you, Lord God, for the promise, for the security that we have in you, as you have washed away our sin and you hold us in the palm of your hand. I thank you, Lord God, that you have saved us into the church and that you have called us and placed us here to be salt and light. But at the same time, Lord God, we know that as much as we have been forgiven, we are also called to forgive. And we know, Lord, that for many of us, if not all of us, we have been offended. But I would pray, Lord God, that if there is division in the church caused in offense, may you be working right now in the hearts of our brothers and sisters and drawing us to repentance, drawing us to humility, drawing us to recognize that we are not to have the, the, the mindset of ourselves, but we are to have a kingdom mindset focused on you. And I know that this is hard. I know that it is hard. But Lord, we would respond to the gospel. And we would forgive and we would fight for forgiveness. Because we know how much we have been forgiven by you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the church. And may we stand firm with one another as we know you more. We ask this in your name, for your glory in our church. Amen. God bless everyone. Have a good week.